the cloud. Here we go. And welcome everybody to Proverbs chapter 23, uh, 31 chapters in Proverbs. So we're a good two thirds through it. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit of change in the um, uh, in, in, in the waters that we've been sailing, at least for the last 10, 11, 12 chapters. We're starting to see verses in uh, chapter 23 that um, blend into each other. Uh, we'll see, especially towards the end of this chapter, uh, a big diatribe on one uh, specific topic, which uh, is good that we're, we're getting it before the holidays. It's on uh, excessive drinking. So uh, the, the, the sages, apparently people back then got blitzed also. So we'll be seeing a little bit about the wisdom of the uh, rabbis as it pertains to that. Um, and uh, we uh, will kick it off by looking at two um, translations that we have. There are uh, a total of uh, 35 verses in this, so a little bit on the longer side. And we'll be looking at the New Vice Standard as well as the, um, the message with Eugene Peterson. So let's see, let me share my screen. As we take a look here, we've got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four of us that will be reading. And so we can divide that pretty much, I guess, to eight, uh, eight, 16, yeah, about uh, eight, 16, 32. Now there'd be more six, six, 12. Um, yeah, my math's not that, that, that good. So maybe eight verses each would be about right. And uh, Pat, we've said a prayer and uh, I, I, I don't know what, uh, what else we want to say in terms of um, prelude here, other than we do want to recognize that uh, these are um, wise sayings from the ancient Hebrew sages, uh, and they are compiled with no sense of, it, with, for the most part, uh, pretty randomly. Um, and uh, they are attributed to Solomon, although even conservative Jewish scholars will uh, will admit that some did not likely come from Solomon, uh, but nonetheless would reflect the wisdom that he had. So why don't we take, uh, Pat, verses uh, one through eight on chapter 23, if that's okay. Okay. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you have a big appetite. Do not desire the ruler's delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Be wise enough to desist. When your eyes light up upon it, it is gone, for suddenly it takes wings to itself, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Do not eat the bread of the stingy. Do not desire their delicacies. For like a hare in the throat, so are they. Eat and drink, they say to you, but they do not mean it. You will vomit up the little you have eaten, and you will waste your pleasant words. Now, there's a mouthful, huh? What do you think? I don't know. Unless it's false treasures, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. I think Peterson's probably going to, to lend a number of um, uh, bits of wisdom to this. Um, anything hits you, Jane, more than anything else? Well, yeah. Um, you don't want someone more powerful than you to think that you're uh, reaching for any of their power. Yep, yep, yep. That's that's a strong current here. Uh, mm -hmm. And first, people are stingy. Uh, they might be giving you something, but they're begrudging it. <laughs> so yeah, the yeah. miser. You won't enjoy it. Yep, yep, yep. We'll take it verse by verse. How do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. Uh, verse 23, which go, excuse me, verse one, which goes into verse two. Uh, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you have a big appetite. <laughs> um, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what, uh, what's before you. And um, that's not simply to look at, uh, uh, you, you know, where's the butter knife and the salad fork so that I don't make a fool of myself. It has to do with the motivation of the ruler. Uh, mm -hmm. Why are they inviting you over? Uh, the person in power uh, is often uh, depicted here in uh, the book of Proverbs as a person who wants more power. And so that person then will have some motivation as to why they're inviting you over. And you're to, you're to think about this is what Solomon wants us to know. Um, there are reasons uh, to therefore uh, 
avoid such uh, invitations uh, if you are invited to sit down, um, because there's going to be some advantage that the person inviting you over is going to look for. Uh, if it's as it's depicted here as a ruler or a person in power, um, they, uh, they, they may um, ask you to do something that violates your moral conscience. Uh, this is what the rabbis would be very uh, quick to point out that, look, one of the reasons you want to avoid this is because you, you, don't, you don't want to be roped into doing something that God wouldn't approve of. A really important point of Proverbs is to keep us on the road of the straight and narrow. And so therefore, you may say, oh, look, I got an invitation to the White House. Uh, well, why did you just win the lottery? Um, did, did, um, are you going to be asked to do something that's going to be a moral compromise? Uh, another reason to avoid such invitations, perhaps, is because uh, if during the course of your conversation, um, you are roped into or privy to say, or feel inclined to say something that violates the ruler, you may get locked up. <laughs> you know, you may, uh, you, you may say something's going to get you in trouble. So uh, that is kind of what putting the knife to your throat is. That is uh, uh, this figure of speech. It's better to, to put a knife to your throat than to ingest sin uh, would be one of the rabbi's ways of, of characterizing this, uh, that um, we want to do all we can to avoid, uh, to avoid sinful behavior. Um, so yeah, this, this idea that, um, uh, that, you know, is the host's offer sincere? Do they love you? I mean, Jane invites me over because she just loves her pastor. And so I just go there and I eat up all the food I can because she has correct motives. Uh, Pat, on the other hand, is always looking to borrow money. So, um, you know, that uh, th then I have to think twice about my suspicions. Of course, those are both facetious to make sure um, you, you guys know that, you know, when we have dinner together, it's on the up and up. But this is kind of the idea here is that when it has to do with the ruler, uh, these are things that the rabbis want us to question. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What and hit me was- Desire the ruler's delicacies for the yeah, but, food. I think we can understand that as a metaphor. Well, yeah, a, a metaphor as well as, uh, you know, the, we're gonna be taking these literally too. Yeah. Um, the, the, the delicacies, um, as you know, the rabbis interpret delicacies to uh, also be things that are good to the taste, but not so good for your tummy. Exactly. Yeah. So that literally uh, when we uh, partake of these things, what is a delicacy may not in the long term really be a good, you know, a good meal for us to, you know, to live on caviar and champagne as CJ likes to, you know, imbibe in there. Um, and all, the, all the trappings of power and riches, we shouldn't desire that because it's deceptive. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they're definitely going to point out the, the um, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, is that sometimes these delicacies can in fact be addictive. So that what happens is you try these things, you're like, oh my gosh, this is great. Um, I, I, I remember reading about uh, the uh, business um, acumen of drug dealers who will frequently give away the first couple of doses for free, uh, hoping that uh, future customers will then be roped in. And that doesn't seem to be too far away here. The idea then of, of a really delicacy when we take that literally uh, is going to be one where um, we want to consider that uh, enjoyment perhaps to be addictive or uh, to to um, be something that, uh, if not you know, literally addictive, be something that they then end up really liking and spending an excessive amount of energy, you know, money and time to acquire. So um, that combined with with sometimes delicacies can be unhealthy. Um, along with what Jane suggested with, with, with a metaphorical interpretation, right? Verse four, don't wear yourself out to get rich, but be wise enough not to do that. What does that say to people? 
just be aware of who is asking and why. I, I think it, it also, Pat, I, I have read a number of biographies of wealthy people and people don't get rich by and large by mistake. No. Uh, they do it because they make that their number one goal. And when you look at Rockefeller and some of these robber barons who really just ate, drank and slept, how can I get more? How can I get more? How can I get more? Um, and I'm not saying that's how every rich person gets rich, but I, I am saying it doesn't get happen by accident. Right. You have to, Always you be aware. Hard. Sensitive. Yeah, you gotta work, yeah, well, you got to work hard for that. And, and the rabbis want us to work hard at knowing God's word and living a godly life. They don't want us working hard to get rich. Okay. This is one of the trappings of the world. And the, under, uh, the underlying lie is that money can buy happiness. Um, and then we all buy into that to a degree. Uh, and the idea is that, well, I, I don't get me wrong. Money makes me happy. I mean, I can buy things that make me happy, but at the end of the day, my, my underlying joy is not something that's been purchased. It's something that comes as a result of prayer, a devotion to God, devotion to scripture, um, and ultimately God's grace in showing us that, you know, when you, desire first and foremost to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, that's the way to happiness. That's really how we, um, how we partake of the best life that, that is. And Jesus called that eternal life. Um, Jesus called that heaven. Um, that when we get that, that loving God and loving others um, is, is, is the way to go. That, that really is arguably what it means to be rich anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's always trade-offs. You, I mean, you've got 24 hours in a day, no matter if you're rich or poor. So, how do you want to spend them? And the rabbis are going to say, spend them getting no, getting to know God. Spend them in 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 the acquisition of godly knowledge and wisdom, and in ways you can grow in loving God and loving your neighbor. Um, don't spend the lion's share or the good hours of the day, um, simply trying to make yourself rich. Now, don't get me wrong. We are to be hardworking and ambitious in our vocations. Uh, and if that does bring riches, which some professions it will, others, it just won't. I mean, teacher gets paid when teacher gets paid, priest gets paid, priest gonna get paid and go down the line. Um, but that we make sure that our number one pursuit is going to be that of, of godly wisdom. A nurse gets paid what a nurse is going to get paid, right, Kathy? Yeah, there's not a lot of campaigning for, you know, right. although there's campaigning now. So, uh, so, so go ahead. I said they can't get enough of them. It's still supply and demand. Yeah, yeah. Verse five, when your eyes light upon it, it's gone. For suddenly it takes wings to itself, flying like an eagle toward heaven. And what is that? That's that's riches, right? Mm -hmm. So this, so verse four and five go together. When your eyes light upon riches, boom, it's gone. For suddenly it takes wings to itself, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Um, but an underlying thought here that the rabbis um, allude to is this idea that if you suddenly get rich, Jane. If you win the lottery, CJ, quickly, quickly write a check and give most of it away. Give it to charity. Give it wings. Because in giving it wings, you're going to get a twofold benefit. One is that it's not going to bring about the great troubles that wealth can bring about. Two, by giving it to the poor, you give yourself it is like an eagle toward heaven. You're giving yourself uh, a present in the afterlife. Um, that, that, you know, distributing that money to charity is going to be good for your soul here on earth. And it's going to be good for your soul when you get to heaven. Um, and that's what this idea is flying like an eagle toward wing, uh, an eagle toward heaven is, uh, is, is let that charity take wing and go as quickly as possible. When your eyes light upon those riches, make it be gone. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. I mean, I, 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 that's a, again, owing to the differences in translations and other translations, it's, it's more obvious. Um, but, but that's what the rabbis really want to uh, impress upon our heart is that money is a false god. Money is an idol. And while you know, we, we live in a, in, in a culture that greatly idol, um, idealizes uh, the acquisition, uh, even the hoarding of wealth as the font of happiness, uh, we're to say, no, 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 no. Happiness is knowing God, loving God, and in and and being um, uh, being charitable towards our neighbors. Verse six says, uh, don't "Can I be devil's advocate for a second? Yes, absolutely. So uh, back in the day that these were collected, there weren't charities. The only charity would be the synagogue. So are the rabbis asking for money?" <laughs> uh, there was certainly uh, an aspect, as is there now, to, to the Jewish religion that was that was aimed at giving alms to the poor, and so you you could give to a fund that would be distributed for the poor, or of course you could just walk down the street and that beggar clanging the cup, you could drop the money there too. Um, so yeah, there may not have been the United Way or you know these kind of big organizations that we give to in terms of charity, but um, there were people. Uh, you know, colonies, leper colonies, uh, uh, you know, there were beggars on the streets, there were widows that one knew of. And I don't know if this really says go and give to the synagogue, because you're right, that, that you know, is, is, are you empowering the institution that employs me, right? I always feel that way when I tell people, I'm giving this much away to my, into my pledge, self-servingly knowing that some of that's going to come back to me, right? Um, but I, I do think that the charity in the wide sense was meant towards, you know, the, the, the obvious uh, appearance of poverty in the day-to-day -day life of encountering widows, of encountering orphans, of encountering uh, panhandlers. Does that make sense? Yeah. I have a question. Now, now that we've brought up the synagogue, back in those days, um, did the synagogue, after it took in its alms, its tithes and so forth, uh, did they have, do they support the poor like our churches do now? My understanding, and I'm not a pro here, I'd have to go look it up, Jane. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that um, an aspect of, of early temple worship, early synagogue worship uh, included um, it, uh, funds of benefit that could be distributed because okay. when Jesus and we find in the New Testament, we find that very prevalent that um, there would be uh, people who are dispatched, we call them deacons, and their whole job is to identify those who are in need of charity and to ask the congregation to, you know, to, to take up an offering. Uh, I'm sure that was stolen from Jewish congregational life okay. um, as we stole most everything else. Yeah, I just wondered <laughs> that since that was mentioned, because there was so much involved in the ritual and the worship and the you know, getting the doves and the bulls and all this kind of thing, and just maintaining the institution. So I yeah. just wondered uh, what percentage of of what they took in was involved in all that. Yeah, if anything yeah. left over to care for the poor. Yeah, and good. wouldn't it have a lot to do with the area they were in, just like today? Because as I read the Old Testament. They weren't quite as giving as they wanted others to give. And it depended really on their area. Okay. According to the history of, um, you know, I've read. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert there. Um, I'm not an expert. It's just something I've been reading and looking at. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thought. Yeah. Um, let's see. <sighs> anyway, uh, verse six then, don't eat the bread of the stingy. Do not desire their delicacies. For like a hair in the throat, so are they. Eat and drink, they say to you, but they do not mean it. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and you will waste your pleasant words. Again, we're seeing three verses that go together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've not seen that in the last 10 chapters as much at all. 
what this is getting at is the stingy can be interpreted as the miser. Uh, what's the miser going to do? Well, they're supposed to eat kosher, right? Um, so the miser might say, gosh, you know what? The Hebrew nationals are so expensive. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to get us some of those ballpark francs. They're on sale. Or, or, or uh, Carol, what are the cheap hot dogs uh, that, that uh, you know, you get for a buck or something? I, are they I, I don't know. I don't eat hot dogs and I won't <laughs> tell you why. <laughs> oh, I can understand why. <laughs> yeah. I eat the veggie ones. And if you cook them right, you can't even tell. Um, and as you put enough toppings on them. Um, but the idea is that uh, uh, the stingy is going to get you in trouble uh, because they're 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 you know not going to uh, be be following uh, kosher, uh, and then the other side of it is uh, is that there um, there there there's this aspect of of uh, I want to be clear about this here, um, uh, yeah. Um, so, so if it's non-kosher, the it's it's uh, what does it say? The uh, the bread of the the. the um, I thought on. I I thought the moldy day old bread. Right. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, you're going to be nauseated by the taste of the food, mm -hmm. um, uh, because it's it's going to be cheap food. And as you're, as, you, as you're right, maybe it's day old. Maybe it's got some, uh, the beginnings of penicillin on it. Um, yeah, I understand this whole thing metaphorically uh, but, in, a, in a relational way. Yep. Um, you know, you're, you're wasting your conversation on people who don't really want to entertain you because they're so stingy that it annoys them to have to feed you. <laughs> hmm. Eat and drink, they say, but they do not mean it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the delicacies that we see in here, there's also an aspect um, of that also. The miser um, is going to, um, remember a delicacy may also not be that healthy. And so the miser is going to you know, eat those um, not thinking that their long-term health will be affected by that. Um, the idea, the, the rabbis are gonna push the idea that um, proper eating involves healthy eating, that you need to be at your best game to study and interpret Torah. And therefore, when you engage in this kind of eating, verse eight, you're gonna vomit it up and you are gonna find that you have eaten um, what little you have eaten and you're going to waste your pleasant words. Pleasant words, of course, are going to be, thank you so much for the meal. May you be blessed in your house for being so charitable. And then you find out the person's a miser and is, is, is giving you day-old bread or non-kosher food um, or a delicacy, which again is interpreted as something that may taste good. But the idea of, um, of nourishment escapes the miser. And, uh, and therefore, you're not getting real food you're, you're getting food that is you know you're eating cotton candy for dinner uh, which sounds great when we're six uh, so yeah so there we go and then uh, I'd like you to read then Pat for us uh, the interpretation here by um, by our friend Eugene Peterson uh, the, the translation rather when you go out to dinner with an influential person mind your manners don't gobble your food don't talk with your mouth full and don't stuff yourself Bridle your appetite. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Re restrain yourself. Riches disappear in the blink of an eye. Wealthy sprouts, wings, and flies off into the blue yonder. Wild blue yonder. Okay. Don't accept a meal from a tightwad. Don't expect anything special. He'll be as stingy with you as he is with himself. He'll say, eat, drink, but won't mean a word of it. His miserly serving will turn your stomach when you realize the meal's a sham. <laughs> Interesting take, huh? I like don't accept a meal from a tight wad. <laughs> yeah, don't expect something special. You're going to get saltines and uh, ketchup packets, right? Well, and I, it's, it's what we're all taught. Be careful who you are with and what you accept as a gift. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. The, learning is very much a spiritual discipline. Uh, there are certain um, expressions of Christianity that really don't put a, um, uh, a lot of emphasis on learning. Um, and and I, I mean, being widely read and uh, just aware of your surroundings. Um, there are, are certain expressions of the Christian faith that say, well, you don't want to pollute yourself. Therefore, uh, don't read anything other than X, Y, and Z. Don't get your news anywhere from X, Y, and Z. When I think that the, um, the, the author of Proverbs would, would promote knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge, which if we know anything, um, comes from a wide variety of places. Uh, God is not limited as to who God speaks through or how God um, is going to get knowledge to the earth. And so I think we're really smart when we say, okay, uh, I'm going to, as a spiritual discipline, um, go ahead and, um, and be more widely read. Um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, and then that may be my liberal bias also. I mean, it's always said that, you know, um, the, the, the liberals need to learn piety from the conservatives and the conservatives need to learn, um, you know, social action and, and justice from the liberals. Um, because we get too caught up in personal piety, we forget about the rest of the world. So there's my sermon in a second for you there. Um, Kathy Graham, you're going to be nine through um, nine through 18. How's that? Okay. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool who will only despise what wisdom, despise the wisdom of your words. Do not remove an ancient landmark or encroach on the fields of orphans. For their redeemer is strong, and he will plead their case against you. Apply your mild, your mind to instruction, and your ear to the words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from your children. If you beat them with a rod, they will not die. <laughs> they may wish they did. If you beat them with the rod, you will save their lives from Shahol. Yeah, my child, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My soul will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always continue in the fear of the Lord. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Verse nine, do not speak in the hearing of a fool who will only despise the wisdom of your words. We hear uh, things like this. Um, uh, in other places here in Proverbs, and that is, don't cast your your your, your pearls before swine, right? Um, the, the swine doesn't know what to do with it, and um, speaking wisdom in front of fools, yeah, you might some of it might rub off, but Solomon is going to warn here um, that that's probably not going to be the case. Verse 10 talks about don't remove an ancient landmark. We talked about that last time. Um, and, and many times that has to do with property rights and um, keeping, uh, keeping thing, you know, keeping law and order uh, or encroach on the fields of orphans. Now, this is a reference to, um, uh, to being kind and charitable to those in need. Uh, the fields of orphans was generally considered to be that portion, the corners of the field that the uh, farmers were asked not to uh, harvest. And, and we have a modern day representative of that. Has anybody heard of Gleaners, right? Gleaners Food Pantry out on the east side of Detroit. Uh, Gleaners is, is, is the biblical way of expressing uh, this idea that a farmer provides for those who have less by not harvesting all of their crops, but by leaving a portion of that crop the orphan's field, if you will, so that those who are hungry may not be given it as a handout, but may be allowed to go and actually work for it. Why? Because they have to go glean what is left in the field. They don't just get a loaf of bread. They have to actually get the wheat, bring the wheat down to uh, the grinder, get it ground, um, get their flour going and, and making their own bread. So this is an, a, an idea that we are not to encroach on those fields of charity um, that uh, really the farmer was obligated to feed the poor by leaving that, uh, leaving that 
uh, portion there. Uh, verse 11, for their Redeemer is strong and he will plead their cause for them. Again, 10 and 11 go together. Verse 12, apply your mind to instruction. There we go, back to instruction, right? And your ear to words of knowledge. A uh, person should not wait to be corrected by others. That person should, in fact, uh, seek self-correction and hopefully the correction of other people. Um, that's how we get better, uh, is by making mistakes. <laughs> that's how we get better, is by Jane or Kathy telling you, look, do this, go that way, do this. Um, and so, so uh, verse 13, don't withhold discipline from your children. We move into the discipline part here. If you beat them with a rod, they will not die. Um, the rabbis are going to interpret this rod as being metaphorical that we're, we're certainly not to engage in capital punishment as the writers uh, of, of, of these words inevitably did. But we are today, a contemporary understanding of this is to, uh, is to understand that the rod is, um, uh, is basically anything that makes a child aware of their behavior. Because back okay. then they meant it literally, I think. Back then, I think you're right. They totally meant it literally. Uh, don't worry, they won't die from it. Uh, but the idea is that the rod is a tool of understanding. It's a tool of discipline to bring to those who know less the ability to know more. And how important is this in verse 14? We're going to save them from hell, right? I mean, Sheol was that trash heap outside the city gates that because people were always creating trash was always burning. And so this is the place of eternal fire and torment. Um, what burns in the fire, things people no longer want. And uh, that can tend to mean it's gonna be something that gives off a, uh, a, 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 a melo melodorous scent, shall we say. And so you don't go to near it, you wanna be downwind of that thing, um, but you're gonna save your children from ending up on what? The rubbish heap that's, that's eternally burning. Uh, my child, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. It ties in with verse 16. My soul will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. And so these two verses, 15 and 16, go hand in hand to anybody who's had kids knows that uh, parents rejoice in the wisdom of their children. And when a kid makes a good decision, the parent is proud as punch. Is that true, Pat? Well, any child you hear wisdom from, I think, is a delight to an adult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He talking specifically my child, parents, and young children, but I thank you for widening that interpretation. Yes, um, you can bring uh, great gladness to, uh, to your child. One of the rabbis says that um, a father tells his son that one of his motives for learning Torah should be to bring your father pleasure right? That your, your parent is going to rejoice in your achievements. I guess Mr. Britney Spears uh, knows that firsthand, right? Um, verse 17 and 18, don't let your heart envy sinners, but always continue in the fear of the Lord. Um, envying sinners in terms of their sinfulness, right? Uh, I'm going to have a wide berth here because I think we're all sinners, um, but we're, but therefore we're all capable of doing well. And so envying the heart of sinners has to do with en envying their sinfulness. The envy of teachers, if you turn the envy around to not the sinful, but the sinless, say your teacher, then your envy of a teacher is going to bring you wisdom. So envy the right people is what this is actually inviting us to do. In uh, verse 18, um, surely there is a future and your hope will be cut off. A person who makes the fear of God their goal is ultimately happier than a sinner who indulges their appetites because hope for reward will not be frustrated and your merits will last until the end of time. Let's see what Peterson has to say. Uh, Kathy, if you want to read this one, it's from 9 to 18 here as well. Okay, don't bother taking sense to fools. They'll only poke fun at you. Oops, hold on. At your words. 
don't stealthily move back the boundary lines or cheat orphans out of their property, for they have a powerful advocate who will go to bat for them. Give yourselves to disciplined instruction. Open your, eye, your ears to tested knowledge. Don't be afraid to correct your young ones. A spanking won't kill them. A good spanking, in fact, might save them from something worse than death. Dear child, if you become wise, I'll be one happy parent. My heart will dance and sing to the tuneful truth you'll speak. Don't for a minute envy careless rebels and soak yourself in the fear of God. That's where you future lies. Then you won't be left with an armload of nothing. <laughs> I like that last line. I like that too. Only an armload of nothing. All right. So let's see, Jane. Uh, let's see. I think uh, have you, you haven't read yet, have you, Jane? No. Yep. We're going to give you 19 <laughs> through 27, if that's okay. Okay. Hear, my child, and be wise, and direct your mind in the way. Uh, do not be among wine bibbers or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe them with rags. Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. <coughs> he who begets a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. My child, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, an adulteress is a narrow well. <coughs> and read verse 28 too. Um, she lies in wait like a robber and increases the number of the faithless. Well, that's uplifting. Descriptive too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the beginning of Proverbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hear my child and be wise and direct my mind the way. Yeah, that's exactly how the book begins. Um, and Solomon makes that great declaration to uh, incline our ears towards wisdom. And um, I like this word, Carol. Have you ever been called a wine bibber? <laughs> no. no. But I drink wine. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> No, I, I love that word. It's a real Bible word, kind of like, a, what else is a Bible word? Abide. Uh, uh -huh. You hear that word a lot in the Bible. You don't hear it really in, in everyday uh, conversation. But a wine bibber um, or gluttonous among eaters. Uh, we can guess what that's going to mean, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, it warns against engaging in gastronomical excesses. And it illustrates some of the consequences of, of such a life. Uh, verse 21, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. Why? They're going to spend all their money on food and drink and drowsiness will clothe them with rags. Um, ever notice, uh, and, and we'll go into depth more as we jump into uh, uh, more of these verses on excessive drinking later on in this chapter, but um, drowsiness. Uh, I, anybody here on Thanksgiving after you eat, you got to take a nap? Oh, that's the best part. <laughs> Is it called postmandial fatigue? Is that it? No, it's called making room for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like yeah. that one, Kathy. <laughs> tryptophan right, so, overdose. What what mm -hmm. overdose? Tryptophan. Yeah, that's the word I was trying to think of. Right. And what is that? Turkey that's jumping in turkey, right? Yeah. Uh huh. It makes you sleepy. Uh huh. But that's just the scientific side. Yeah. Is, is that a chemical, uh, part of the chemical makeup of a turkey? Yeah. Oh, okay. So tryptophan, what else contains that? Oh, uh, I'd have to Google that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just know that tryptophan and turkey and sleep go together. <laughs> okay. And you might be drinking wine along with the turkey. There you go. Um, and so and that- uh, It's carbs. It's a perfect combo. Uh, listen to your father who begot you. Don't despise your mother when she is old. Um, it's interesting that they would put your mother when she is old in there uh, because chances are the dad would have gotten older faster anyway. Uh, and as Kathy 
uh, schooled us this morning that men die earlier because they take more chances. Um, so that on top of that, men typically in this era marrying younger women um, in Bible eras there, that this would have been on top of that. Um, don't despise your mother when she's old. Uh, and and the, the picture here that's being painted is uh, a, um, a widow uh, who perhaps might have the beginnings of dementia or something like that, uh, where it may be easier to write her off. Uh, it, the, the, the writers of Proverbs want you not to do that at all. Yeah, when the mother is young, she's doing stuff for you. When she's old, <laughs> she may not be able to do yeah. stuff for you anymore. Other than share her acquired wisdom. Um, well, that's children. when we have the, as children, that's when we have the privilege of taking care of our parents, mother, mm -hmm. father, or both. Yeah, before we farmed it out, right? Verse 23, buy truth, do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, understanding. Another word for truth here, the rabbis would say it would be Torah. So you want to uh, acquire Torah, um, not get rid of it, but acquire it. Acquire wisdom, instruction, understanding. Verse 24, the father of righteous will, uh, will greatly rejoice. He who begets a wise son will be glad in him. Analogous to a verse we read just a short time ago, let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. Uh, then in verse 26 here, we're going to get to, um, to the prostitute. My child, give me your heart and let your eyes observe uh, my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, an adulteress, a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the number of the faithless. Uh, again, a contemporary rabbinic understanding is not going to be nearly as paternalistic um, or, or chauvinistic is this. And the, um, the, the, the synonym they're going to use for prostitute and adulteress is simply idolatry, right? Or an idol. For an idol is a deep pit. Idolatry is a narrow well. Idolatry lies like a robber and increases the number of the faithless is going to be the more contemporary understanding of what that is about. Uh, the heart is the seat of desires, and God exhorts us to channel our will and our longing to him and his service, is the commentary on uh, this idea of being a pit and a narrow well. It's something that channels. And one way to do this is to limit our consumption of the resources of this world and to concentrate on attending wisdom, the wisdom of Torah. That's what the rabbis are going to beat into us over and over again. Um, and so uh, one of the things that uh, verse 28 and, uh, and 27 get to is um, how we fall into these pits of idolatry it begins with um, how we expose ourselves to, um, to, to evil and to idolatry. Are we going to entertain it? Um, Flip Wilson, uh, when he talked about Geraldine, uh, would talk about Geraldine uh, walking by this dress shop and then Geraldine uh, walking past the dress shop again. And then Geraldine stopping in front of the dress shop and looking at the dress and Geraldine then going into the store and uh, she will eventually say the devil made me do it when she wrote the pastor's checkout. Geraldine is married to a pastor. And this whole idea that a conversation develops into gazing, gazing develops into inappropriate thoughts and appropriate thoughts, then ultimately will lead you to the depth of sin. Uh, and this being something that you want to um, let your eyes observe God's ways and not the deep pit or the narrow well, or um, th that the fact that idolatry waits like a robber uh, and increases the number of faithless by this idea of temptation. Um, and then 29 through 35 is where we're going to, uh, we're, we're, we're going to run into this, uh, in, into this idea of, of excessive drinking being something we want to avoid. And so we save that for you, Carol. Uh, and, oh, thanks uh, before, so much. <laughs> wait, before, before we go there, I want to read uh, Peterson's uh, versions here of what Jane just read for us. Um, Let's see. Okay, I think uh, 
Is that right, uh, Jane? You want to read that, Peterson's? <laughs> Don't for a minute envy careless revels. Soak yourself in the fear of God. That's where your future lies. Then you won't be left with an armload of nothing. Oh, listen, dear child, become wise. Point your life in the right direction. Don't drink too much wine and get drunk. Don't eat too much food and get fat. Uh, drunks and gluttons will end up on skid row in a stupor <laughs> and dressed in rags. Um, listen with respect to the father who raised you. And when your mother grows old, don't neglect her. Buy truth. Don't sell it for love or money. Buy wisdom, buy education, buy insight. Parents rejoice when their children turn out well. Wise children become proud parents. So make your father happy, make your mother proud. Dear child, I want your full attention. Please do what I show you. A prostitute is a bottomless pit. A loose woman can get you in deep trouble fast. She'll take you for all you've got. She's worse than a pack of thieves. Yeah, I don't like the fact that they left out the part about uh, increasing the number of the faithless. Mm, yeah I mean, he makes some good points here but he kind of took it in a different direction yeah yeah okay. but i think that part about increasing the number of the faith less or robbing you of your faith that was very important right right all right carol you're on for our last uh, bit here who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes. Those who linger laid over wine, those who keep trying mixed wines. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things. Ooh, <laughs> DTs. <laughs> And your mind utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pat, get out your Bible and turn to Psalm 107, verse 23 to 27. Uh, what did you think of that, uh, uh, Carol? It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> it's funny how much things don't change, isn't it? Yeah. Well, al alcohol has always been something that's been abused. Yeah. It, it, I mean, we've, we just, every culture seems to find one and, one and another way to make it. Um, whether we make it from corn or rice or... Uh, wheat or what or grapes barley yeah grapes mm -hmm. yeah and who has woe who has sorrow who has strife who has complaining verse 29 who has wounds without cause and who has redness of eyes <laughs> well it's those who are lingering late over wine and those who keep trying mixed wines don't you love this idea that uh um that, that uh you're, you're gonna spend the night drinking in the best taverns uh, in order to get drunk again. Um, verse 31 says, don't look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. Apparently to the writers, uh, red wine was more, um, more temptuous that uh, it was really, oh yeah, this is the preferred color and, um, uh, and, and, and taste apparently. Uh, and so that was particularly uh, enticing. And then verse 22, for anybody who's ever maybe had a little bit too much to drink, uh, at the last, it will bite you <laughs> like a serpent and will sting you like an adder. The interesting thing is a serpent, when it bites you, uh, can hurt you, but an adder can kill you, uh, is, 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 is one of the interesting observations, I think, about that verse. Uh, I think all of us chuckled at verse 33, your eyes will see strange things. Um, you said something like DTs. Yeah, DTs. What are those? Delirious tremors. Oh. People coming out of alcoholism see strange things. Okay. I am told. I've never seen it. 
okay. on the hoof, so to speak. Yeah, and your mind utter perverse things. Uh, and and I, I, you know a little bit about substances. Isn't alcohol like considered a poison? And it and it everything depressed. is a poison in its volume. Okay. Yeah, and and but certainly isn't alcohol a depressant? It is. Yeah, a, it, yeah it is a depressant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's celebrate by by toasting with a depressant. Um, I guess that's one way to, you know, limit the scope of your celebration, right? Uh, and then uh, I Pat for verse thirty four, I had you pull out uh, Psalm one hundred seven. Could you read verses twenty three through twenty seven for us? Verses 23 through 27. It will help us make more sense of verse 34. Then went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest. They lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Okay, so uh, verse 34 says, you'll be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies down on the top of a mast, he is, is trying to make that parallel between, um, you know, I, I think that's why, do they still do that when you, they pull you over for drunk driving, they make you walk a line? Um, this is the idea, is it's, it's, it, it is just as difficult to walk a line on a ship at sea as it is, uh, when you've imbibed, uh, when you've been overserved, shall we say, uh, you may as well lie down on the top of a mast. That's how queasy you're going to be. Uh, verse 35 ties into that. They struck me, you'll say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. And when I shall awake, I shall seek another drink. So a drunkard grows oblivious to uh, what's happening around them in terms of pain and in terms of, uh, of, of, of what they may be feeling. And the, the sad, sad thing about alcoholism is that even when you go through all this, you wake up the next day and you just want another drink. Um, you wanna go ahead and uh, read this in Peterson's um, edition here, Carol? Who are the people who are always crying the blues? Who do you know who reek of self-pity? Who keeps getting beaten up for no reason at all? Whose eyes are bleary and bloodshot? It is those who spend the night with a bottle for whom drinking is serious business. Don't judge wine by its label or its bouquet or its full bodied flavor. Mm -hmm. Judge it rather by the hangover it leaves you with, the splitting headache, the queasy stomach. Do you really prefer seeing double with your speech all slurred, reeling and seasick, drunk as a sailor? They hit me, you'll say, but it didn't hurt. They beat on me, but I didn't feel a thing. When I'm sober enough to manage it, bring me another drink. Whoa. That's so sad, the whole thing there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Especially where they talk about the drunken sailor. I think that that really bothers me, especially in today's climate with so many in the service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I think Peterson came from a day where that was a very common saying. Yes. Well, it's still very common today, but unfortunately, I'm not one that likes always the common. Well, I also think that he's trying to tie it into that image of being, um, you know, on a uh, on a ship that's, you know, going back and forth, um, trying to. Yeah. Rough seas will make you walk yeah. like you are drunk yeah 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 i think he's trying to tie in there without actually having any alcohol in your system <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i've i've not been pulled over for drunk driving before and i'm horrible i've got terrible balance anyway i i i feel sorry for <laughs> happening i don't think i walk a line even you know it's first thing in the morning but uh certainly not on a ship there um, that's going through rough seas. So an, an interesting chapter for us, uh, reminding us of the evil, certainly as we ended up with drinking, uh, but also re uh, reminding us to, um, to uh, uh, raise up children with uh, discipline and um, 
to, uh, to be disciplined ourselves in our study. Um, I hope this was helpful for you all. Any other takeaways? First part of it was, was almost a blueprint for some of the courses that I had to take as an employee for not taking bribes, <laughs> take care of who you work with. Take, I mean, and I had to take these courses annually. So, it, but it was pretty much a blueprint for that, those courses. And, and how to treat your boss uh, when yes. they invite you to dinner. Yes. <laughs> Don't order a, yeah, who was I talking to recently who, uh, they were in the Big Sisters, Big Brothers, Big Sisters program and they, um, and the, the person that they were paired with, um, no matter where they go to, they order the steak and the surf and turf and, uh, and to say, look, you can do that for me. I'm your big brother, but uh, don't do this when you go on a job interview. <laughs> so anyway, well, good. Well, listen, I hope this is helpful. We're, we're up to verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 24 uh, next time. Uh, so we're gaining on it, 30, 31 chapters. And um, I hope this was as helpful for you as it was for me. Uh, thanks for... Uh, for coming and may the blessing of almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.